First of all, I want to welcome you, not that you're new here, that you're new in family of God, God's kingdom. And it's really wonderful to, to see, to experience um, when someone surrenders to the Lord and gives his or her heart and life in his hands. It's... Uh, it's actually what it's all about. That's why we are here. That's why God brought us in this world. And so that's the most uh, beautiful thing. And uh, yeah, speaking for myself, that it brings me and it brought me to tears. And it, it cannot be otherwise because it's really, yeah, it's a wonderful thing to uh, to witness. So, and it's very encouraging for us also. And uh, we should. Uh, cherish that, that moment and that day and remind ourselves of this because this is really uh, beautiful. The, the things that are happening in the world around us are very strange to say the least uh, in many ways but specifically where it uh, concerns um, the things that God has foretold in his word. And <coughs> As much as the Bible is, is very personal and gives us lots of um, words and teaching for our lives, uh, it's also telling a lot about the general history of the world that we live in. And uh, that helps us. It helps us in many ways. It helps us to, to put things into perspective. And it also helps us to find out where we are and what's next. And that's important. And, and in, in these days that we live now, maybe even more than ever, because things are going so fast and the information is available to everyone. I mean, a few hundred years ago, if there was an earthquake in, uh, in Japan, you wouldn't know here. <laughs> and you would never know. But now, when it happens, uh, the tweets go right around uh, all of the world and everybody knows even before it's on, on the news. So we are very aware of what's happening in the world. And people will ask questions and um, we have to, as Christians, also be able to, to answer these questions, to understand these things um, in the biblical perspective. Now the Bible is uh, about one one third is, is uh, prophecies, and uh, there's thousands of prophecies, and many have to do with the first coming of Jesus, and many have to do with his second coming, and with the events preceding that, and also even with the, pre the events after that. And I want to look a, a bit at this to to see how. Um, how powerful it is and how detailed it is also. And as we have seen time after time, again and again, it's also very precise, very detailed. God is not uh, doing things uh, by estimate or uh, as he goes along. No, he has foreseen everything into the smallest detail. And uh, I know in many churches um, they don't speak about prophecy, uh, biblical prophecies, um, because they don't know, or it's uncomfortable, or it's uh, they think it's speculative, or all these kind of things. Well, we'll see. It's none of that. And but we have to understand first what a prophecy is. 
because there's a lot of misconception about, uh, about the word prophecy. And, um, the word simply means proclaiming God's word. That is to prophesy, to proclaim God's word. So, um, basically, when, when we listen to a teaching from God's word, we're basically listening to prophecy. But we have the... Um, we think that it often it's, it's predicting the future. That is not so. Certainly, it's not necessarily so. Um, it's, a prophecy is a message. And um, this is a message, obviously, from God. It should be, at least. And a message, this message has a, usually a purpose. It can be just a message to encourage us. To declare something, it can also be a warning. Often prophecies are actually warnings. Beware, this and that is ahead. It's like you're driving on the road and you have a sign that there is a sharp bend. The, the sign that you see there along the road is like the prophecy for telling that there is a danger ahead so that you can slow down or whatever you need to do. So many prophecies are like that. So they help us, once we understand it, they help us to be prepared for whatever is ahead of us. And they can also indeed be a prediction, so foretelling an event that is going to happen. And in that case, there are two possibilities that we can find in Scripture. It can be a prediction that is bound to conditions, so it's circumstantial. Or it can be absolute. So what I mean by that, for example, the prophet Jonah, he went to Nineveh to tell them that they had 40 days time. If they would not repent, the city would be destroyed. So it was a prophecy, but it was not absolute. It was with a condition. Only if they would not repent, the city would be destroyed. They repented, the city was not destroyed didn't like it, but that's the way it works. So that is, that is also a prophecy, and it's not a false prophecy, it's not that it didn't come to pass. No, God said, if you do not repent, then the city will be destroyed. Many prophecies are like that, but others are absolute. They just tell this and that is going to happen. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, this was clear. The angels came with this message, the city will be destroyed, and uh, <coughs> There was no, uh, nothing to avoid it. This was just set to happen. So these are two different types of um, predictions. Now, if we speak about biblical prophecies, then the fulfillment of it, it can also be different. It can be in Scripture, like the two examples that I gave, Sodom and Gomorrah and also of Nineveh, they were fulfilled in Scripture. We can read in Scripture how it came to pass. The many prophecies about the coming of Jesus, we can read about Jesus' birth and life and everything in Scripture. So we, we have the prophecies in Scripture, but also the fulfillment of it. There are also prophecies that we find in Scripture that are not fulfilled in Scripture. For example, the Old Testament and also Jesus himself spoke and uh, speaks many times about the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the Jews among all the nations. This is not in Scripture. It happened actually after the Bible was completed. So we know that it happened from history. So we can still verify clearly what was foretold has happened. And some or some, many uh, prophecies that are in Scripture are not yet fulfilled. And this means they are in our future. <laughs> and these are most interesting for us, because that are this, if we understand these signs, this is like driving on the road, seeing the signs, knowing the danger, or whatever it is, is ahead of us. And we can also understand how far ahead it is to a certain extent. Now, the source of all these prophecies that I speak about so far is from God. It's from Scripture. And that's very important. Because most, script, most prophecies in the world are not from God. 
Satan is very good in prophesying things uh, with the purpose to mislead people. So we have to discern whether something is from God or not. The scripture says, discern the spirits, they are not all from God. So we have to be very careful if people start saying things. And actually, they should always be in line with scripture. And if they are not, if you cannot test it that way, then you better not pay too much attention to it, I would say. I want to look at, um, at some details um, just to see how, how precise God is when he prophesies. It is, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite stunning. And this is because it's God. In, uh, in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, God makes a, a very clear declaration of who he is. And very powerful. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So, very clear. It's, it's very bold, but God can do this, obviously. He says, I am God, and he uses this, this phrase, I am, several times that we know, of course, it's also how he identified himself to Moses. But he says, declaring the end from the beginning. I, I know already the end. I have already set everything. Um, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. And that is actually very comforting. Because this, knows, this means that, that God is in control. Of all the things that are happening around us. He is in control. So... Sometimes we feel like losing hope or thinking this, this is never going to work out uh, good. But God is in control. And, and, and you said this also many times, all that, that applies to history applies also to your life. If you allow God, then he is in control. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything in between. He, let him do, do it. There's no one better, uh, as he says himself, there's none like me. We are often uh, arrogant and think we can do it. That's also what we spoke about last Sunday, as it says in Revelation 3, verse 17. Uh, I'm rich. I don't need anything. That is often the attitude of, of men, and in this case, uh, in Revelation, even of Christians. They have this arrogance. They don't need things. Uh, but God says, no, you're poor, you're miserable. You are in great need. And so, and so we need him. And we can trust him because he knows the end from the beginning. He's in full control. So I want to go to, um, to one particular um, prophecy that has to do with, with Jesus. And I think I spoke about this last uh, Passover. But it's not, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a prophecy uh, that we find in Daniel, and um, these few verses there, we will read uh, several pieces of it, but Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. So it says here, uh, basically, that when uh, the, the commandment is given to, to restore and build Jerusalem, from that moment on, there are seven weeks plus uh, 62 weeks, until the Messiah, the King, shall, um, shall be. Now, when Daniel wrote this, Daniel was, of course, this was during the Babylonian captivity. The Israelites were brought to Babylon. And a few years after that, 
after they were taken into captivity, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple, the first temple, was destroyed. And, and therefore, he writes here, it will be rebuilt. And from the moment that the commandment is given to rebuild it, that is what he says, it will be 69 weeks in total until the Messiah, the, the prince or the king, says it's the same word in Hebrew, until he will be uh, revealed. And he adds something there, the street shall be built again and the wall. So the, these are details, and as I've said many times, these details are very important because they are there for a purpose. There are a few things you have to understand, uh, um, which is, when we talk about biblical prophecies, there is always a certain language that is being used, and certain metaphors that you have to understand in order to, to know what it says. <coughs> he speaks about weeks to begin with. Now, it says here weeks in, in my translation, I don't know how it is in your translation, Probably it's the same. Uh, this comes from the Hebrew word Shavua, which means seven. And it can be any period of seven. It can be seven days, like our week, but it can also be seven years, or even 7,000 years. In this case, and there are other ver verses here in Daniel that, uh, from which you can understand this, but we won't go there. But in this case, it's seven years. So these are weeks of years, not weeks of days. So when he speaks of 69 weeks, it's times seven years. So that is one thing we have to, to know. The second thing is that uh, the calendar the Bible uses is not the way we know the calendar today. Our calendar is relatively young. 1500 uh, something, um, the Gregorian calendar. So it was during the reign of Pope Gregory, I think. And that calendar we use today is based on the Roman calendar, or no, on the Julian calendar actually, which is from 46 BC, which is based on the Roman calendar, which was a few years older, about 50 BC. So before that, uh, this does not, did not exist. Um, and we always go, and we, we talked about it many times, with, with the Hebrew calendar. That is the biblical calendar. I should, should call it biblical calendar, not Hebrew calendar. Maybe it's more clear. It's God instituted this. And that calendar is based on the moon, contrary to our calendar, which is based on the sun. And the biblical calendar has 360 days, not 300. 65, like ours. So this, these are things you have to understand or to know in order to be able to, to find out what, what is exactly meant here. Now there are, um, while the, the, the Israelites were in captivity, there were several uh, orders to rebuild Jerusalem. And, but that's the start point that uh, Daniel gives here. He says when this commandment is given. So you have to know which one do we use. There are actually, in the scripture, you can find three moments where this is declared, that Jerusalem should be rebuilt. And that's where the details count, because he says here, uh, the street shall be built again and the wall. And there's only one that includes the streets and the wall to be rebuilt. And so we know exactly which one that is. And that is the order um, given by uh, Artaxerxes, and this was in 445 BC. We even know the exact date uh, on our calendar. Again, that did not exist yet, but if it were on our calendar, it would have been the 14th of March in that year. All these things uh, are written down when a king makes a declaration. It's written down and, and sealed. So, and, and that these chronicles, uh, they, they exist. So that's very good because we can verify exactly to the day when this uh, was uh, given. And <clears throat> we can find it also in scripture, um, in, in Nehemiah. Nehemiah 2, verse 1. 
It says there, and it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time said in his presence. And now he was said, and the king asks him why, and he talks about because of Jerusalem and all this. And then in, uh, uh, yeah, in verse 8, the king answers this, uh, this sadness and he, he makes this declaration. A letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give the timber to make the beams for the gates of the palace, which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the kings granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And it continues then. So here we see that the order is given to rebuild also the wall. So we have it even in scripture, this, and we know exactly when it was, in the month Nisan. And maybe you remember, Nisan is the first month. Okay? It used to be the seventh month, before Exodus 12, and we went over this, but it's now the first month, Nisan. And again, we know even the day, it was actually the tenth of Nisan. Remember this day, the tenth of Nisan it was. So... Um, that is when this order was given. So that's the start point of, um, of the prophecy that Daniel gives. So what I want to do is show how you get from this prophecy to the exact day. So it was um, the 10th of Nisan, or on our calendar, 14th of March. So this is, this is the start point of, of the prophecy. This is what we just read from Nehemiah. The 10th of Nisan, or the 14th of March, 445 BC. If we calculate back to our calendar. That is when the order was given. What does Daniel say? He says there are 7 plus 62 weeks. Why these are t two periods? Um, we just leave in the middle now. But it is 69 weeks. Yeah. That is the period that he gives. 69 weeks. And we know that these are Every week is seven years. It's 69 weeks each seven years. Let's first do this. Eh? So what do we get? Seven times uh, 69 is 483 years. So Daniel gives it in weeks, but when we calculate it to years, we come to 483 years. Now, again, these are Hebrew years, or years on the biblical calendar, having each 360 days. So, if we want to know on our calendar how many years it is, we have to make a little calculation, because our years are five days longer than, than the, the biblical years. So, what, what I'm going to do is calculate the number of days that this is, then divide it by 365 find out how many years it is on our calendar. Okay. 483 times 360. So many days. So what is Daniel saying? From the moment that the commandment is given, the 10th of Nisan, 445 BC, it is so many days until the Messiah, the King. That's what he's saying. Now in our calendar, this would be 173880 divided by 365 and a quarter, because we have every four years a leap year, 476. 
76 years, it would be on our calendar. So you see the 483 are lunar years, these are solar years. 476. And so if you start now, 445 BC, and you add 476 years, where do you end up? But, but, <laughs> it's true, it's 31. <coughs> so you would think you would end up in 31 AD, but that's wrong, because there's no year zero. The calendar starts with the year one. So we have to add one year. And so it's 32 AD. So that's the year of the Messiah, the King. Now, we know, of course, who the Messiah is, Jesus. But during his life, Jesus was never seen as the King. Except for one day in his life. One day he was the King. And that was what we know as Palm Sunday, the day that he entered Jerusalem uh, on, on a donkey. <clears throat> but then he was seen as a king. That's the only one time. And on what day was that? <coughs> you can know this from um, Exodus 12. Because in Exodus 12, uh, it is just before the Israelites leave Egypt. And it is then, at that moment, the seventh month. And God says there in, chapter, in the verse 2, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So he says, now this will become the first month. So that's the month Nisan. Yeah, it's the same month. What does he say there? Um, in verse uh, 3, Speak ye to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take them every man a lamb. On the tenth of that month, Nisan, they set apart a lamb. And then, if you read on, on the fourteenth they are to, to kill it put the blood on the doorpost. The 14th is Passover, of course. It's the 14th of Nisan. And the 10th is actually the, the first day of the, of the week before Passover. And we know this day as Palm Sunday. And so, if you do the exact calculation from the 10th of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar and you add the... Um, 73,880 days, you will end up on the 10th of Nisan in 32 AD on our calendar. Then. It was actually um, the 6th of April, or the, I think, yeah, the 6th of April, but that was Palm Sunday. And that was the one day that Jesus was king. So you see that this prophecy that uh, Daniel gives is very precise. It's to the exact day. And it's, it's the only one day that he was seen as king. So it's one of the many examples that you have seen that shows how precise God is. He does things and he does them exact. And, uh, and again, that is, he wants to, to go with the same um, preciseness in our lives. I'm giving you now a timeline. And we'll explain what it says. Um, this, what we just this did, was like an introduction to something else we will discover now, and it's relevant today, because this is all about Israel, and it's all about Jerusalem, and if you go to the news, now at this moment, it's about Israel, and it's about Jerusalem, and as we will see that this is very relevant. Examples of prophecies given in Scripture and having their fulfillment in our days. What we see here is um, 606 BC was when the Babylonian captivity began and it lasted until 537 BC. So that's 70 years. And a while after the Babylonian captivity began, in 587 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed in the temple. And again, exactly 70 years later, 580 BC, it was rebuilt. 
So I first want to, to look at that because the, the temple speaks of the temple. The Bible speaks about uh, these things and, uh, and brings it to our time. And that is very profound. But God has declared from the beginning that he had a peculiar people and, and <clears throat> that from that nation the Messiah would be born and th th that's his people and he calls it Yahudi the people of God that's what it means and even until the, the, the end uh, if we see Revelation it's the book of Revelation, it's still about Israel and about uh, Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's the focal point of all the events. It's also the place where Jesus will return, as we can read from Zechariah 14. And so it's, it's, it's very um, interesting, to, to say the least, to see that now in the news, and in the United Nations and everywhere in the Arabic world, Israel is, is the focal point. It's all about Israel. And it's very strange if you think of it from a, from a logical point of view. That you think, why? It's such a small piece of land. Why would they bother? There is so much land there. Why do they care about this tiny piece of land? But we know why. Because it's God's land. It's God's country. And an interesting thing is that uh, someone did once a calculation of all the land mass on the planet and um, how much the, this weighs, the, 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 the mass of all the land, and where the point of gravity is. So everything that has weight has a point of gravity somewhere. And the point of gravity of all the land mass of the, of the earth, of the planet, is Israel. So it's really the in that sense, the center of the world. That is not by chance, of course. You also find in Israel the lowest point on the planet. So, um, I want to look at um, a prophecy that uh, we find in Ezekiel. It is written in the period 593 BC, uh, between 593 and 571 BC. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 4, Ezekiel 4, verse 4 through 6. If you read this, uh, <coughs> there are also many of these strange things that you can find in, in Jeremiah. You think what these, these prophets had to go through in order to, 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 um, for God to show something. Here the instruction is as follows. Lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it thou shalt bear their iniquity for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days 390 days so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel and when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now this, if you read this, you think, what is this all about? <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> uh, so the, the prophet gets the instruction to, to lay on his left side for 390 days. That's a long time, that's more than a year, a year and a month. Uh, for uh, Israel, that's the northern part, the northern ten tribes. And then again for 40 days for Judah, for the iniquity of Judah. So it's, it's the punishment of Israel, the punishment of Judah. 390 and 40 days. And then in the end, God says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So, so what, what do we have? And, and, yeah, usually when you read this, you don't pay attention because it doesn't make any sense. But all these things are there for a reason, of course. So this is, this is what we have. 
390 plus 40. At that time, Israel was two parts, northern and southern, but it's altogether it's 430 days. And each day is a year, so it's 430 years. And this is judgment. So Ezekiel gets here from God, through this prophecy, the amount of years that judgment will be upon Israel. It's 430 years of judgment that they will receive the punishment. It's like you go to the judge, you've committed the crime, and the verdict is 430 years imprisonment. Yeah. Now, they had already served 70 years in, in Babylonia. So these, same if you go, if you are, go to the judge and he says you have to go to prison for 430 years, but you were already 70 years uh, in, in pre-arrest, this will be subtracted. This is how uh, even human law works. So we are left with three 60. Right here, plus and there, minus. Yes, that's the time that's already done. That's the Babylonian captivity. So 360 years are left. Now, God has given um, a law long before that with regards to his judgment, how he would pour out his judgment, and what rules he would use. And therefore, we have to go to Leviticus 26. And it's, it's very much like, like a father giving the house rules. It's like you say to your child, if you do that and that, then you're not allowed on the computer for a week. Something like that. So he's giving the rules ahead of time, so that you know, if you cross the line, you know what's, what's awaiting. Leviticus 26, verse 18, he now continues on this. He says, but if you still do not listen then, it's going to be worse. Same you could say to your child. Eh? You're not allowed for a week or you have a house arrest for a week, but if you still do not listen, then it's going to be seven weeks. And that's what God says here. 26, verse 18. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. This is part of the, of the house rules that God has given for his people. And then in verse 21. And if you walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Same thing. Repeated here. And he repeats it even once more. Verse 27, if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And if they still don't listen, verse 33, and I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw, you out, and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. So God has foretold long, long before all these things happened, this is what I will do if you don't hearken unto my word. So this is an example of, this is not an absolute prophecy, but this is linked to conditions. Because the Israelites did not keep God's laws, they went into captivity, into Babylonia. However, after that, and we can also read this in scripture, they did not, they did still not obey God. They continued with rebellion, with disobedience. And thus, this rule comes into effect. So these 360 years that were left have to be multiplied by seven. It's 2,520 years. That's a long time. <coughs> So we know the start point was when they went into captivity, into, into Babylonia, which is 606 BC, you have on this timeline. That's when it starts. From there, we have to go 
2,520 years forward in time. But again, these are lunar years, biblical years. So in order to know how many years this is on our calendar, we have to do the same we did before, divided by 360, Sorry, multiplied by 360 and then divided by 365 and a quarter. Agreed? 2,483 days on our calendar. You also start to, to understand why God has said in Genesis 1 verse 14 that he has put the, the lights in the, in the firmament for a calculating time. And why he is he has instructed how to, to count the days and the months. Uh, because otherwise we would be unable to do this kind of uh, calculation. Because our calendars have changed over the years many times. And we have added days and, and all kinds of corrections. And it's very inaccurate. But in this way we can make an exact to the day calculation. So... We know exactly now how many uh, years. We know also the start point. It was 606 BC. Yeah? That's when the, the Babylonian captivity began. Yeah? With 606 BC. The captivity itself was 70 years. Yeah? Until um, 537 BC. So we can subtract those. They are already served. That's 536 BC is where we, we land. Yeah. <coughs> it says on your timeline 537 BC. It depends whether you will include the, be the beginning year or not. But it doesn't make much difference. So beginning of the Babylonian captivity, the end of it. And now from that point on we have to add the 2483. 83. And again, we will cross the year zero, which does not exist, so we have to add one year. So it's 500 minus 536 plus 2483 plus 1. 1948 is the year in which independent Israel was declared. And it was indeed the first time since the Babylonian captivity that Israel was independent. Because after the Babylonian captivity, they were not independent. They were, uh, after the Persians, they uh, were um, occupied by the Greek and then by the Romans. And then they were dispersed from the land. So they had not been independent since the beginning of the Babylonian captivity until 1948. And it's also known on which day the Babylonian captivity started, <laughs> and if you do it exactly in days, you will find that it's on the 14th of May, 1948, the exact day that the signature was set on the document to declare the modern state of Israel. So with the Babylonian captivity, Israel lost its independence, and in 1948, they regained their independence, exactly as God had foretold. <clears throat> and you can see on your timeline that uh, the Babylonian captivity was 70 years, and actually from the end of this captivity until 14th of May 1948 is 7 times 360 years. So people think that they, they decide things, they have meetings, they have wars, and they come to a certain day, now we set the borders for the land, and they think they are in control. But God is in control. This is really amazing. And, and again, it's not different in our lives. We can do all kinds of things and think uh, we don't need God, but He is in control. It's much easier if we just follow him and um, let him have his way. <clears throat> now, the scripture says that um, in order for something to be valid, you need two or three witnesses. 
And there is actually a witness to this in scripture. There are more prophecies that come to the exact same day. I want to look to one other one. This just shows how great this God is. Um, we go to Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So, they knew exactly how long they had to serve uh, in Babylon. 70 years. Now, we, can we take now another approach and we say, <coughs> did they uh, hearken unto God's word after the 70 years? No, they did not. So, according to Leviticus, we can multiply the 70 by 7, which is, of course, 490. It's 490, but the 70 years they served, of course, so we subtract them. We end up with 420 years that were left after the captivity. And indeed, after the Babylonian captivity and the um, occupation by the Persians, they were occupied by the Greeks, they still did not hearken unto God's word. And so, what does God say? He repeats three times in Leviticus, I will, times seven, times seven. So, they still did not hearken unto God's word, so we do again time seven. 2,940 years, minus the 420 already served, ends up with 2,520. And if you remember, or probably have it written down, it's the same amount of days we had before. So, if you do now the same calculation, you end up obviously on the same date, 14th of May, 1948. So here we have used uh, Jeremiah's 70 years and the rules that God had given in Leviticus to come to the same day. Now there is, uh, we're not going to do this, but there's a third way through the prophecies of uh, Daniel. And so we read before from Daniel 9 verse 25, but if we go to 24 from Daniel, Daniel 9 verse 24, it says that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So 70 weeks, it says, are determined upon thy people, speaking about the Israelites. Now 70 weeks, we already said before, these are weeks of years, so 70 times 7 is 490 years, minus again the 70 years of the captivity is 420, and you see you end up with the same point you are here. You can again do times 7, and it's the same thing, so you can go from um, Ezekiel, from Jeremiah, or from Daniel, it will all come to the same day three more ways to do the same calculation. That's okay, I think the point is clear. So that's the precision with which God works. Now there is um, a second event there on the timeline. There is the captivity, so the, the loss of independence, and then there is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, because when they were first brought into captivity, many stayed in, also in Jerusalem and in Israel, and they, uh, they lived there, well, uh, the king became like a governor under Nebuchadnezzar, but they were allowed to, to stay there until some years later everything was destroyed. And so that was in um, 587 BC, the destruction of the first temple. By the way, on the 9th of Av, uh, this I did not mention, but uh, actually you know it already. The 14th of May 1948 was Shavuot, or Pentecost. So it's not only the exact day so many years later, but it's also on an appointed day. 
and we know now also the destruction of the first temple, the ninth of Av, would be the same day that the second temple would be destroyed, and also has a, a meaning even in our time. How can we get from this uh, destruction of the temple, which is and, and of Jerusalem? That's actually what it's about. They lost Jerusalem. How do we come to uh, to our times? We have again the same thing with Ezekiel. This is. 390 days and the 40 days, which is uh, 430, uh, so uh, 430 years then, eh? every day a year, and we use again this uh, factor of uh, 7 that we have from Leviticus, and then we have 3010 years is the total uh, judgment. Now this this is not the captivity. So now we cannot say we subtract 70 because they already served. This happened during the captivity. So the start point is different. So we just go with this, um, with this uh, number. Now um, Daniel says uh, 70 weeks are determined, which is red, which is 490 years. These we subtract from this. Uh, 2,520 years. If you go from 500, uh, well, we know also uh, this is lunar years. I can write it right away because we have done the calculation already. This is um, 483 years on our calendar. This is lunar years, solar years. And if you add this to 518 BC, that's when the temple was rebuilt. Yes, you can see on your timeline the end of uh, the, the rebuilding of the, the temple was 518 BC. So if you go from 518 BC and you uh, add these 400, 2483, or maybe to be more correct, it should be 517, and then add the one year for skipping the year zero, but okay, it comes in the same, the result is the same. 1967, and 1967 was the Six-Day War. That was the, the year where the Israelites reconquered Jerusalem. So from the point that they lost Jerusalem, when it was destroyed, we can again use this calculation to come to the year, not only the year, the exact day, again, where they reconquered uh, Jerusalem. And here you can again do the same, you can use several uh, methods, but you will come to the same uh, result. And, and again you see also in your timeline 70 years between the destruction of the temple and the rebuilding, and then 360 times 7 years until the recapturing of Jerusalem. And yeah. It's again, it's people doing things and fighting wars, and uh, they think they are in control, but it's God. These are really things that show that, that God is in control of all of history. And obviously it hasn't stopped in 1967, it continues, and it continues to our day. And it's very in important to see this. It's even so important that Jesus told us to do so. It's an instruction, actually, that we have. And in that light, it's very strange that many Christians do not take notice of these things. Um, in, in Luke 21, verse 28 and 29, this is the parallel to Matthew 24, from which we read a lot. But there Jesus says, after giving all, all the signs, Luke 21, uh, verse 28. So he's giving all the signs of wars and rumors of wars and uh, earthquakes in diverse places and all these things. And then he says, and we also sang this uh, in the song uh, earlier, uh, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, 
you can only know if these things begin to happen if you're observing them, if you're looking for them, if you're checking. And that's the whole purpose why we have this information. And he says, so when it begins, then you have to look up. Because your redemption draws near. That's the, yeah, his day is near. And so it's for us to look up and be ready. And then in verse 29, he says, And he spake a par to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Or the translation says, and all the trees around about. When they, they plural, now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So he gives them again, in addition to all these signs, another, even uh, maybe more clear sign, yeah, he says, you can see it yourself. Just look at the fig tree, and we know the fig tree is Israel, and the other trees around it. You will see when they begin to, to sprout forth, then you know the day is near, the season is there. And so, uh, what do we see when we look uh, to Israel and the other trees, the other nations, uh, nations around it? We see a lot of things happening, and a lot of things that... Uh, are unique to our time. As was prophesied, uh, the, the Jews were dispersed among all the nations. That was the last clause we read from Leviticus that God would do. Um, and this happened in about, um, started 70 AD, lasted uh, several decades, but they were scattered among, literally among all the nations. And until yeah, 1948 and the years preceding that it began already. Uh, and all these years the land was barren. It, it didn't rain in Israel, which is, by the way, also prophesied in Scripture. It literally didn't rain, so no other people could, could settle there. And uh, only after 1948 it began to rain again. And that was not uh, weather controlled by man was weather controlled by God. And the land became prosperous again. <clears throat> and, and then we, we see uh, that's the start date where we say the prophetic clock began to tick again because that's when the fig tree began to sprout. And also something happened with the other nations around it because for, for hundreds of years there, there was... Nothing actually there in this area. Uh, Lebanon did not exist. Syria did not exist. Iraq did not exist. Uh, Jordan did not exist. These countries, they did not exist. There was desert. And uh, there was uh, occupation by, by Western countries, British mainly. There was this British mandate. But uh, in 1947, they just took a map and, and a ruler and they just draw through some lines and this is going to be Syria and that's going to be Iraq and etc. And, and they were just um, fabricated you could say. So uh, the modern day, uh, modern state of Syria did not exist uh, 100 uh, years ago, a bit more. And the same for Iraq and Jordan. So these are all, they were all re, uh, recreated not exactly along the original borders, but the names were given back and all this. And it's interesting because there are prophecies that go to our time about Syria and about Lebanon and about Jordan. And so they could never come to pass if the countries were not there. So we, we see really from the moment that Israel was independent again, and these nations surrounding Israel came into existence again, that's when the time started for these prophecies to be able to be fulfilled. And so we are really living in this, this prophetic time, in these last days, as the Bible calls it. And I want to read a few uh, of these prophecies, because I'm sure you go home and you speak with your husband or uh, you're at work and you speak with colleagues, 
they all have opinions and ideas about what's happening in the world. And with the refugees, the large influx of refugees from, from mainly from Syria, and, but this is all in the Bible. We can explain these things. We know that they have to happen. And actually, we can also know why they have to happen and what is the end result. But I will not go too deep, but there are things that we can, we can answer. We can say, yes, but this is in the Bible. God is in control. He has a plan with his planet. And therefore, he has also a plan with you. So, um, Jeremiah 49, I want to go to. Because the focal point the last four years in the Middle East, um, if it comes to, to unrest, is Syria. Uh, we've had, of course, other countries, uh, when the Arabic Spring started, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, um, Iraq. Uh, but Syria is, uh, it keeps going on. All this fighting there and uh, most of the population is displaced either in or out of uh, this uh, country. And it's not over yet. In Jeremiah 49, verse 23, it speaks about this. Yes, concerning Damascus. Now, uh, uh, one other thing we have to understand. Often in the Bible, countries are either named by their name or by their capital. So often when it speaks about Jerusalem, it speaks about Israel. And so here also it speaks about Damascus, but actually it's about Syria, which becomes clear from the context. But I'm just saying, concerning Damascus, Hamath is con confounded and Arpat, for they have heard evil tidings. They are faint-hearted. There is sorrow on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Now when we read this, it doesn't mean so much to us. We know Damascus, this name, because this is regarded the oldest uh, city in the world that has, has continuously existed. But Hamath, we don't know uh, this name, but the modern name of Hamath is Homs. And Homs, uh, if you have followed the news uh, the last couple of years, it's been in the news often. There's a lot of fighting uh, around Homs, city of Homs. And Arpat, the modern name of Arpat is Aleppo. And Aleppo, of course, we also know close to being completely destroyed. And so these are indeed uh, two of the places where there's a, been, a, been and still is a lot of fighting and unrest inside Syria. And now you see it says concerning Damascus and then it talks about these two cities. So Damascus here refers to the, to the country more than to the city. There are evil tidings and they are faint-hearted. There is sorrow on the sea. So it also speaks about the sea, which is true. Uh, if you search on the internet how many uh, naval vessels are off coast uh, Mediterranean and from how many nations, it's incredible. So there is indeed unrest in the sea. And it cannot be quiet. And then it says, Damascus is waxed feeble and turned herself to flee. So here you see <coughs> that... Damascus, Syria, has become weak, and it, they be, it begins to flee. These are the refugees that it speaks about. They are fleeing. Fear had seized on her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her as a woman in travail. This uh, we see <coughs> more often, this woman in travail. We know this is when a woman begins to give uh, birth and uh, the labor pangs start. And we know uh, once they start, it will increase. It will not stop. It will increase and it will become more, uh, more often and more severe until the birth. So that is the, the picture. That's what's meant here. It will not calm down. It will continue. Therefore, uh, well, 25 first. Uh, how is the city of praise not left, the city of my joy? Damascus is here called, God calls it the city of my joy. It's one of the cities that are, that God loves actually, and it will also uh, become again, they will turn to God actually, <laughs> at the very end, Syria and Egypt.
together with Israel. These three are mentioned. But now it is not left. He says, this, this is not, not left. Therefore her young men shall fall in the streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, said the Lord of hosts. The men of war are, of course, the soldiers. They shall be cut off. They shall be killed. And then it comes. So th this is what's happening now today, eh? and, and, and has happened the past period. So we know we are there. It's written uh, 700 years before Christ, give or take some years. Uh, but this is now. So if we continue to read, we see what's next. And I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Now it speaks about the city. It's the wall of Damascus. It will be consumed. And it also speaks about the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Now Ben-Hadad is not a name, it's a title. It's like Pharaoh or Caesar. It means the king. So the palaces of the king, the ruler, that's uh, Bashar al-Assad today, these palaces will be destroyed. So we know not yet in the newspapers, but we know it's going to happen. Because God's word said so, and we have seen how precise God's word is. It does not fail. So this is coming. And I keep my finger between Jeremiah 49 and come back here. We go briefly to Amos chapter 1. Because prophet Amos also speaks about this event. And it's the, here you have again the, the witnesses eh, in Scripture. And this event is also, um, it's fail-safe, so to speak, because Damascus has never been destroyed in its long history of thousands of years. It has never been destroyed. It has always been there. It's the longest perpetually existed, uh, existing city. And in Amos 1, verse 3, it says, Thus said the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have thrust Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. It's again. I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the plain of Avon, and him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden, and the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto care, said the Lord. So here we see again Damascus will be destroyed. The prophecy here is a bit uh, enigmatic because it says for three transgressions and not for four, which means uh, God has spared them for three transgressions they have committed against Israel, that is. But the fourth time they won't be spared from that. So it has to do with conflict in which they engage against Israel. And that's very near. There are already actually uh, regularly going rockets from Syria into uh, Israel. And there is, of course, this dispute about the Golan Heights. So this is, um, this is very, very actual. This is now, it's very near. And there is a third prophet who speaks about this event, and that is in Isaiah. Isaiah 17. And usually um, this is quoted, but you see that there are three prophets who speak about the same thing in parallel. Isaiah 17 is um, titled The Burden of Damascus. And I will re read only the first and the last verse of this chapter because that says it all. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. So simply saying it will no longer be called a city. It will only be ruins. And again, this has never ever happened in history. And in verse 14, the last verse of this chapter, it says, Behold, at evening tide, that's in the evening, there's trouble. And before the morning, he is not. So in the, in the evening there will be trouble. 
and in the morning it will no longer be there. So it, the city will be, will be destroyed in one night. Now it's already, there's lots of ruins in the city, but this shows that there will be some weapon of mass destruction or something of this kind that will destroy the whole city in one night and turn it into, yeah, that it's not even being called a city anymore. So we see how um, precise the Bible is, and we, yeah, we, can, we just look to the, to the news of today and of, of the last months and few years, and we see all this, we live in these times now. And so we should not be surprised if, if we actually hear this, uh, this happening. And, um, it will not happen just like that. Uh, there will be a conflict, of course. And Israel is involved because uh, Amos, uh, the whole chapter one of Amos describes the several enemies of, or enemies, neighbors, I should say, of Israel that will turn against Israel and will be destroyed. So there, there will be a chain of events. And Damascus is one part of that uh, chain. That is also why Jesus says in Matthew 24, when the disciples ask for signs, he says there will be wars and rumors of wars, but be not disheartened or be not troubled. These things have to happen. They have to happen because they are prophesied. They are part of the history that's already written. And there's also a deeper reason why they have to happen, because after all that, the tribulation period will start, and the Antichrist will take rulership of the world and all this prepares the, the global geopolitical situation for that Antichrist reign. So, yeah, if you really study all this a bit deeper, then you will see that there is, there is a clear path. And it's very dramatic, of course, because people die and it's a lot of misery. But uh, this, is, uh, this is the world that we have uh, created ourselves. This was not how God had intended it. I want to go with this to actually what, um, what happens uh, more particularly with the victory with Israel itself, but we will stop here for today. Um, Israel is in the, in the crosshairs uh, now more than ever because just a few days ago in um, last Sunday, in Paris was this conference and this summit with 70 nations or 72 nations, which is also a prophetic number, is also in the Bible, um, who were deciding or forming an opinion about the, the peace between the Palestinians and Israel. And they have unanimously concluded that the two-state solution is the solution, which means dividing the land. That's exactly, and we'll read this next time, Lord willing, that's exactly what God said that would happen and that he will not allow. The land shall not be divided, he says. It shall no longer be two states or two nations. It literally says in scripture. But of course, all these wise men of these uh, nations of the world, they think they are in control. And, uh, history will repeat and we will see again, God is in control. These things have to happen. But so these are very prophetic times. And uh, it is now today, as we speak actually, um, the UN is, um, is making a vote on this topic. And um, we will see what they vote. Um, can go either way. If it's not now, then it will be a short while from now. But the, the, the thing is that they want to go back to the situation 1948 with regards to the borders, which means the West Bank, uh, Gaza, uh, Golan Heights, uh, and some other places will no longer be Israeli, but they will Palestinian. So <clears throat> that will, of course, not happen just like that. But um, that's what uh, the rulers of the world, the kings of the world, are, are talking about. So these are very prophetic times. And uh, on the 1st of January, um, we had this uh, meeting in 
this church in Holland. And I remember I started saying, uh, it's on the record by the way, because it's on YouTube. I started to say that this year is a very special year where lots of things are going to happen. And I really believe so for, for different reasons. Um, we will see. But we have to listen to what Jesus said when he said, look at the fig tree. That's what we have to do. And realize that we are actually witnessing God's hand working in, in, in history. And at the same time to realize that this is how he also work, works, or wants to work at least, in our lives. He wants also to be the one who is in control. And we should not be like the kings of the world, like these, these ministers and presidents in the United Nations and, and the representatives thereof that think that they can vote and decide how God's land is divided. We should not be like that in our lives. It's the same thing. We should not be the kings that decide how we divide our time and divide our activities. He is in control. He knows the end already from the beginning. If we put it in his hand, uh, we don't need to go through all these troubles and uh, difficulties with the risk of losing everything. So that, that's the, the personal message that you can get from it. But um, yeah, again, it's, we, we see how great this God is and how special the times are that we live in. They are very special. And, uh, I think his day is, indeed is near. Nearer now than when we first believed. Amen.